Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, there may still be some people who are going to join us over the next minute or so, but we'll we better kick off because we've got quite a quite a lot to do this afternoon. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, as you know, this is our workshop on supporting newly arrived migrants during lockdown. Uh, my name is Alessio D'Angelo and I am an associate professor at the University of Nottingham um, and uh, I have been co-organizing this event with, with my colleague Chiara Manzoni from NISER, the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. Uh, so this is a jointly organized event, um, a first in a series as we're going to explain uh, in a moment. Um, in particular, this event arises from a project which Chiara has been leading on, um, which is funded, has been funded by the ESRC, the Economic and Social Research Council uh, here in the, in the UK. Um, I think most of the participants today um, are from the UK, the majority, but we have some people from Italy and some people from, from other European countries, which, which is really good because um, Chiara study and some of the other projects we are we are developing um, have in fact a European uh, approach so it's going to be um, interesting from that perspective in terms of sharing experiences and sharing practices both within countries and across countries okay so I'm going to take you through the plan for today um, and by the way, in terms of data protection, you may want to know that this event is going to be uh, recorded, uh, but we are only recording the plenary presentation. So what Chiara and myself are going to say, and we are recording the PowerPoint, the slides. Uh, we are not recording your individual videos, uh, nor what you will be saying in, 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 in breakout sessions later in the afternoon, okay? Um, so this is the plan. We well, welcome is what I'm doing right now. So once again, uh, welcome on board. If you've just joined over the last few seconds, as some of you have done, um, I'm going to um, give you some background about this event, and again, some more forthcoming initiatives. Uh, but then the meaty part will come after that, uh, with Chiara sharing uh, the findings from the research projects on. COVID-19 and school closures, the impact for migrant students. Um, some of you I know uh, were involved in that, in that project as informants or participants, so it's very good to have you on board. So there was gonna be a presentation from Chiara. There's going to be time for uh, questions and answers. Um, and then after that, we are going to uh, move you into breakout sessions, parallel rooms, uh, because Again, one of the objectives here is to give time to people who are working in education, in schooling, in different roles, and to have an opportunity to talk to each other, um, share experiences, share practices, share ideas, um, and maybe see uh, whether from today we can start developing some kind of a network, some kind of a community of practice. So hopefully, if today works well, uh, this is the beginning of a uh, conversation okay um, now about the breakout sessions we are planning probably to have at least two separate group discussions uh, one focusing on primary schools and another one focusing on uh, uh, on secondary schools okay so before i move on i would like you to express your preference and let you know which of the two groups you'd like to join. So I do hope you're all familiar with Zoom and the, and the interface, but I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, not your real hand, but your electronic hand. So if you can see where the raise hand button is in the interface, it's usually somewhere when you can see the list of participants. If you click on participants, then from there, you should be able to raise your hand, okay? Now, I hope that is clear for everyone. Uh, someone is, ra is raising the hand already, but please keep your hands down for now. Uh, don't raise your hand yet, okay. Because I would like you to raise your hand only if you want to 
be in the primary school group. So if you're interested in the primary school conversation, please raise your hand. Okay, keep it up. I hope you've all raised your hand if you want to be in the primary school group. Um, Rachel, Rachel Tuki, who's working in the background with technical support is now going to take note of that. And so she will know uh, where you want to go. And we are assuming that if, you're, if your hand is not up, it means you're not interested in primary. And by default, we will try to put you in the secondary schools discussion. Okay. All right. Um, I hope Rachel has captured, captured that, that information. Um, and so we can move on. Um, so after the presentation from Chiara, you will get a pop-up menu on the screen, which will allow you to move to the breakout, breakout room, okay? Um, that session is gonna last for about an hour, but it's going to be a pretty kind of informal hour, so you can have a chance to grab a cup of tea if you haven't done it already, um, relax a little bit, and again, talk with your colleagues. Um, and then at the end of the hour, there will be another pop-up window that will allow you to come back to the plenary when we can all report back on our conversation and, and have some, some further discussion all together. Okay. Um, I see a couple of people have written primary, please. I can't raise my hand or things to that effect. So thank you. We'll take notes of that. Um, so in fact, yes, by all means, you can use the chat, of course, if you want to ask any question, uh, particularly after Chiara has presented uh, the, the research. Um, you can either raise your hand and, and we'll let you speak or, or you can write your question in the, in the chat. Again, we know there are some people who work in countries other than, uh, than England. So if you are from Italy as well, you may have guessed from my accent that I'm Italian. So if you are Italian yourself and you'd rather ask your question in Italian, uh, feel free to do that and then Chiara or I will will back translate into English for everyone else. Okay. All right. Um, I think at this point you you can um, lower your electronic hands. So hands down, please. And we can actually start. Now, if you are uh, here today, uh, clearly it's because you are aware that um, the lockdown uh, and the school closures that we've seen all over Europe uh, since last spring uh, have been affecting all students. Um, but at the same time, uh, different students and different families have been affected differently. So some people, in fact, have been talking about COVID as a multiplier of inequalities, uh, health inequalities, of course, but also socioeconomic and, and education inequalities. And, and migrants, and particularly newly arrived migrants are a group which has been um, affected disproportionately um, in terms of access to education, uh, in terms of very often not having the, the right technology at home, but more generally in terms of their ability to, to navigate the school system, to understand uh, a school system either for reasons of language or simply knowledge of, a, of, a, of an educational approach which may be very different from, from that of, of the parents, for example. Um, issues of language, of course, um, count a lot, uh, but more generally, there's been difficulties in this very sudden switch from traditional schooling into sometimes hazardous uh, online schooling, that there's been problems in translating specialized forms of support, uh, particularly for migrants, and, and refugees, for example. Um, again, you probably know some of these things firsthand, so I'm not going to get into the details uh, of the, well, the details of the general issues, but Chiara and I have been writing um, some blogs on this topic. So if you're interested in finding out some more about um, the evidence and the knowledge that has been pulled together up until now internationally about, again, the impact of COVID and the lockdown on school closures. Uh, there are two blogs which I'm listing there on the slide. And as soon as I finish presenting, I'm going to paste 
the web link to those blogs in the chat. So if you are very interested in that, you can read them uh, later in your own time, okay? Um, I would like, however, to tell you a little bit more in terms of what we are planning to do. Well, it's not necessarily to solve these problems, but at least to support people who are working on these issues and kind of providing spaces for exchange of ideas and exchange of experiences and, and opportunities for, for networking. Um, so one is this online platform called Learning for Citizenship. Again, I will post the link in a, in a minute. Um, and that is an initiative which is run jointly by us at the University of Nottingham, as well as the University of, of Barcelona, the Autonomous University of Barcelona, and the University of Turin with the sponsorship of the Social Policy Association in the UK. Um, it's simply a blog where we are posting information from across Europe and particularly those three countries in terms of research, updates, reports, events like this one. Um, so you may want to go and visit that website if you want to find out more. Of course, something else we as a loose network of researchers and academics are doing is, is well, the project uh, undertaken by Chiara on, on COVID-19 and school closures, which again, in a, in a few minutes when I stop uh, rambling, you will hear about and you'll have opportunities to ask questions about. Um, I also want to highlight that this is meant to be the first of a series of three events. So we are going to have another event early in the year focusing on the role of first sector organizations, NGOs and civic society in supporting migrant children in schools. So in a sense today we are focusing on the experience and role of schools and teachers. In the second event we will focus on the on the role that first sector organizations can play and that is going to take place probably uh, at one point in February. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then there's going to be a third event, um, probably in June, um, which is going to be aimed more at researchers and academics. We'll invite researchers and academics who are working in this in this area, but of course it will be open to to everyone. Um, so after the event, you will get an email, uh, you know, the usual feedback form about the event, which is always very important. Uh, but we will also ask you with that if you're happy to be part of this conversation, be part of this community. And if you are, uh, we will let you know about these forthcoming events and any other initiative that we may be running in the future. So again, hopefully this becomes a way to connect uh, independent researchers, academic researchers, and most importantly, uh, teachers and those who are working uh, in the field, okay? So this is what I wanted to tell you to kick off. And I suppose at this point you've all joined and hopefully you're all sitting comfortably. Um, and so I will uh, stop sharing my PowerPoint, assuming my computer doesn't crash when I do that. No, it didn't, brilliant. Okay. And so I'm now uh, leaving the floor to Chiara, who's going to tell us about her research project. Over to you, Chiara. Uh, thank you, Alessio. Thanks, everybody. I will try now sharing my screen. Let's see if I can. Yeah, can you see it? Okay, so um, the research I want to present you today focuses on uh, COVID-19 and uh, school closure and uh, and obviously on the impact for, for migrant students. I think that uh, Alessio already kind of uh, give you a brief presentation of, uh, uh, of myself. I'm a researcher at NISER, the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, and, um, and I've carried out uh, this uh, research uh, um, from May until October. So the, the research aimed to explore the challenges that uh, COVID-19 has raised for schools and teachers in general, but uh, in particular to, to understand the impact of the actual lockdown and school closure for newly arrived migrants. And uh, I wanted to investigate 
school responses and uh, practices used to support newly arrived migrants. As I said, the research was uh, carried out from May until October, and uh, the idea was to provide a rapid response by, by, by doing a follow-up of uh, um, a follow-up of a research uh, I, I did uh, last year. And so I got back in touch with some of the schools who participate in a previous study. Um, and uh, I've asked their willingness to take part in their study. And the reason why I started by contacting them is because uh, we already collected uh, um, a long list and short list of uh, practices that they were using in order to welcoming and facilitate the integration of newly arrived migrants. And um, so, so basically, after the first uh, exploratory phase where I reviewed different policy contexts and uh, I contacted the schools who took part in the previous research, I also involved other schools all, around, all across Europe that attended dissemination uh, event and uh, I conducted uh, online interviews with uh, teachers and uh, teachers. And, uh, and I did so mainly with schools in, uh, in England, in, uh, in Italy, in Spain, and, uh, and in Switzerland. Uh, so while we know that uh, the pandemic has been a global event, I, I just want to give you uh, a brief uh, understanding or um, brief you about uh, shortly about the differences uh, that uh, refer to different policy contexts that actually resulted in uh, different approach to closure and uh, reopening. And uh, I want to do so because uh, it's, uh, it's quite uh, important when we are going to discuss about practice to understand differences in context. And uh, for example, uh, because Italy was the first country hit by the COVID in Europe, uh, schools there remain closed after the carnival break. So, which means that uh, teachers and schools were not actually prepared. Um, not that uh, in the other countries they were prepared, but uh, they had a bit more of time um, to prepare material and to uh, think about uh, um, IT devices, this tiny, tiny bit, while actually in Italy uh, they went directly from the carnival break into the lockdown. And um, another difference is that uh, in the UK and uh, Switzerland, uh, schools were open for children of key workers and vulnerable children, while in Italy and Spain, schools, uh, schools were closed for, for all kids. Um, on the reopening side, in the UK and Switzerland, schools partially reopened from June for a small number of pupils and specific year groups, while this was not the case for schools in, uh, in Spain and uh, in Italy. I also want to say that uh, teaching has uh, turned into a distance learning for everybody, but the availability of uh, advice as well as uh, tools and uh, guidance and uh, support has been mixed not only between countries but uh, also within countries and uh, and also the preparedness uh, of schools to to impl implement uh, this uh, shift smoothly has been really mixed and um, in Italy for example the Ministry for of Education actively supported schools and teacher in the implementation of digital learning and, and the infrastructure there was already in place and some teachers were already trained, even if uh, not them actually took that this would have been useful or they actually needed it. But it's important to, to stress this because in other countries, it took longer to, to prepare and to put uh, actually an infrastructure in play, which was not already there. Um, so during the interviews, teachers reported a series of challenges faced by both pupils and parents during the lockdown period. And uh, for example, teacher reported uh, a general lack of uh, technical equipment for quality online learning, 
which refers to computer as well as uh, a stable broadband. And uh, also some pupils only had access to online learning through parent mobile phone. And, and in some cases, only one device was available for, for different siblings. Also pupils lack basic resources such as uh, pens or even papers and colors to do activities. Teachers also reported like lack of adequate space for distance learning, particularly in the case of those uh, living in overcrowded accommodation. Uh, another challenge was the lack of motivation because of uh, social isolation or because of lack of parental support. And, uh, and this seems to, to be more evident for those countries who decided not to go ahead with the exams or assessments. Or even in those countries, like for example in Italy, where the exams were modified and they went ahead, the motivation changed um, from when it was communicated to, to before. And um, another challenge um, was, uh, was basically the decrease in, uh, in confidence in, in speaking the Austrian on Aust country language and, uh, and basically a decrease in the vocabulary and uh, ability to, to speak due to the lack of practice outside home. And uh, particularly in the case uh, uh, of schools in the UK, it emerged that uh, because of uh, all communication with teacher went through parents, it could took uh, long, particularly if parents were working on shifts or were key, uh, key workers or unable to communicate or unable to be reached. And, uh, and so for quite a long time, the schools lost track or lost contact with the pupils and uh, families. Another challenge reported uh, by teacher, which emerged mainly in the case of schools in England, refers to the to the lack of resources for English as additional language pupils, which are designed not to be uh, used on by pupils on their own, but uh, which are designed to be used by teacher to support the English as additional language pupils. The following slide uh, highlight the challenges faced by, by parents and uh, include language barriers, which impact on parents' ability to understand the information they receive from schools, but also the information that they receive from government guidelines, which were not only translated in different languages. Also, parent language barriers impact on the ability to support and deal with the homeschooling. So in some cases, and particularly in the case of uh, Roma, Teachers uh, reported no literacy skills within the family, which added obviously an extra layer of difficulties because uh, if you can uh, not read and uh, if you are not able to understand the language, um, this is uh, particularly difficult when, uh, when there's the lockdown and uh, all communication went through emails or newsletters. Also, the lack of familiarity with the curriculum and the education system made difficult for parents to actually play an active role in, uh, in pupils' uh, learning process, which was uh, something that, um, um, that, uh, that, that was expected by schools because uh, obviously um, schools expected parents to support pupils during this uh, homeschooling process. Teachers also reported the uh, lack of uh, parents' IT skills, so they were not able to support pupils. And uh, it's important also to mention that uh, parents were actually facing financial difficulties and uh, some lost their jobs and uh, had no access to benefits and uh, were socially isolated. And for all of this uh, reason, they, obviously the education of their children was not uh, the top priority and, uh, and this was, uh, was a massive uh, challenge in some cases. Um, the following slides will focus now on the strategies 
used by schools to overcome the barriers I just mentioned. So to overcome IT barriers, some schools were able to deliver Chromebooks and uh, provide uh, inter internet access if needed. So teachers deliver digital literacy lessons through phone calls or, or video to, to explain how to connect, how to access the school material, how to upload it, how to download it. Um, because even in the case of, uh, of those pupils who receive the, the devices, this was not uh, so easy for them to, to connect to the broadband. And, um, and so teachers were there to, to support this process. Also teachers were supporting family in dealing with uh, practical necessities, including how to assess funding to buy food, uh, so they were also signposting uh, families to food banks or directed them to local or national help organizations. And in some cases, also schools became food banks and teachers were redeployed to distribute food to those in need. So this gave you um, a view of, uh, of, the, of the challenging situation that uh, actually um, and, uh, and the strategy that uh, um, the school schools were, were facing in, uh, in this uh, difficult time. Teachers also conducted home visits to, to key families, as uh, some pupils went off the radar and teacher had uh, very little or no, or no contact. And uh, so they were just uh, trying to do uh, to do welfare visit to check if everything was okay, if um, the family had uh, all uh, what was needed. And um, so basically what uh, teachers told me is that uh, schools provided emotional, more emotional support in some cases rather than educational support. And uh, the timetable and type of activities that uh, were designed were Tailor to, to support pupils emotionally more than from an educational point of view. So in some cases, schools realized that uh, the IT availability was, uh, was just too low. Um, so the, the offer there from government or for, from third sector organization was not enough. And this was particularly in the case of the UK or Spain and where they got the, the support also came too late and uh, not uh, for everybody. So schools prepared and print paperwork material that was delivered door, door to door, or they were asked parents to come and pick it up from schools. And uh, material included pens and papers and uh, study book for specific year groups because uh, some schools decided instead of uh, investing money on uh, devices because this would have been just uh, impossible for everybody they decided to invest money in uh, in study books for for specific year groups a uh, strategy used to overcome language uh, barriers includes the use of uh, translators so schools were translating translating materials and uh, sending it to parents. They were using interpreting services as well as uh, multilingual teaching assistants and uh, language lines to communicate both with parents and uh, with the students. Schools were also sending new newsletters on a regular basis to parents to explain the school's approach and also to help them navigate government guidelines. Um, teachers were also busy doing welfare calls with parents and motivational calls with, uh, with students. And uh, they were also using parent ambassadors, which were reported as a crucial resource to connect with family, particularly um, with our to reach group like, uh, like Roma, for example. Um, to support migrants, uh, uh, teachers also offer individualized uh, support through phone or video lessons to explain tasks or to explain specific context. 
Here is important to, to mention um, a huge difference between different contexts. Like for example, in Italy, um, teachers were delivering live lessons. So they were delivering it for primary school and also for secondary schools. So in primary schools, lessons were more for small groups, like up to six. And uh, this was quite successful as uh, pupils were allowed to see and chat between them. And uh, they, um, they were starting these um, lessons uh, by doing stretching exercise or by singing. And, um, and teachers were also were recording self-explanatory videos for pupils to follow instruction and, um, and to do activities without a huge supervision of parents. In the case of uh, secondary schools, lessons were for either small or bigger groups and, uh, and schools also offered individualized support for newly arrived migrants or one-to-one -one lessons, particularly in the case of, uh, of those uh, uh, children who um, were sharing the space with siblings and needing the device. So teachers were able to, to adapt to kids' needs and uh, offering also individualized support in a more tailored time. In the UK and Spain and also in Switzerland, uh, students were asked more to uh, upload and download materials and so basically they were downloading material, they were then uploading um, their exercise or their task and they were receiving audio or video feedback and uh, in the UK particularly they were also using quizzes or websites where activities were set up based on on the level of each student. Uh, to boost motivation schools were were using social media or interactive projects to to engage with uh, with young people and uh, um, I collected a really interesting list of, uh, of uh, nice activities and projects using drama or video or crafting exercise or cooking. And uh, I encourage uh, teachers to explain to the rest of the group in the, um, in the following section because uh, I think that uh, there are some interesting and uh, inspiring activities to do to boost motivation and also um, to, to reach the hard to, to reach groups, let's say. Um, another uh, interesting practice uh, was to connect with the newly arrived uh, migrants with the native speaking peers to, to ensure that uh, they have a higher opportunity to interact in the, in the native language because uh, as, we said, as we said earlier, during the lockdown and uh, with the social isolation, pupils were not actually able to practice uh, the hosting country language because uh, within the family, they tend to use their mother tongue language. Uh, mentoring programs were also offered to, to support uh, uh, study skills. And uh, my final slide is, uh, is about uh, resources and uh, tools used. So, so obviously, as I said, in Italy, they were delivering live lessons and they were using Google Meet, Google Classroom, or Cisco Web, WebEx, sorry. Uh, in the UK, they were, they were using different uh, uh, tools and resources, which I put together because I think that are quite uh, useful and uh, interesting to share. And um, some are mm, more specific for primary schools, others are more for secondary schools. So they've used uh, Twinkle, Class Dojo, or uh, Flash Academy, or Loom to record video, or Rosetta Stone to create material for English as additional language students. Also, it's important to have a look to the uh, Bell Foundation website because recently, they've um, uploaded uh, interesting resources which have now been developed for uh, home learning support for English as additional language pupils. In Spain, 
um, they've used Zoom, Telegram, and WhatsApp to connect with the parents and to record and send videos, but uh, only at the beginning, because then the government said that this was not allowed. So um, Aules, which is the a specific platform for the Valencian community was developed and, uh, and this is now the uh, platform used to upload and download material. So thank you very much and uh, I'm here now uh, for your questions. <laughs>